what I would like you guys to, to think about and have in your mind for the next two hours and a half while you're with me, right, is not about, hey, how do we create value for customers? How do we shape brands? These are all great questions, but let's assume for the next two hours and a half that you've done that. The job is done. You've got a great brand, you've got a great product, you've got a great service. The question I want to focus with you on, guys, is this one here. How do we convert that into revenue for the organization? Now, I think that's an important question. I, I spend most of my professional time thinking about this question. The reason why I think about this question is important is because, you know, see this customer smiling over here? You don't take, this, you don't take those smiles to the bank. You can't go to a bank and say, hey, I want, to, uh, I want to deposit some smiles. At least I don't think so, okay? You don't pay back your investors in satisfaction. Even more important, you don't put that satisfaction back into the business to create better products and services. So at some point in time, we've got to think about, hey, hold on a second. How do we take all of the front end of marketing and convert it into cash for the organization, the back end of marketing? So it's an important question. Um, let's just think about this for a second. Up here, all of you guys, I suppose most of you guys, if not all of you guys are in marketing and sales, all of, you, all of us have been trained to think about customers, right? If you want to do the top ones successfully, we've been trained ever since school to say, well, don't take your product and go out and throw it at the customer. Think about the customer and work your way backwards, right? We've all, we've all read at some point about customer orientation. Think about the customer's needs, think about their wants, and then, only then, work your way back towards their, uh, the actual products and services that can satisfy those needs. So, on the top, when we create value for customers, all of our attention is on the customer and we work our way back. On the bottom, it's more like this, right? You it's very, very different, right? When we create value for customers, we're really all about customer. What do you want? What makes you happy? What makes you satisfied? How can I know more about you? We work our way backwards from customers. When it comes to capturing value, on the other hand, we say, customer, who cares? Well, almost, right? We say, okay, hold on a second. What do we need? How do we get by? What's the return that we need? What are our cost bases? Okay, we, it's kind of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in a sense, right? Our, our face completely changes and we start becoming much more internally driven. Okay, fine. Uh, who cares, right? Well, we should care. The reason why we should care is because this change in focus makes us lose opportunities, makes us lose, uh, leave revenue on the table. At worst still, as you will see a little bit later today, uh, it actually makes us destroy that value that we work so hard to create with our customers. Uh, what I want you guys to keep in mind is one very big idea. We'll go deep down into this, but one very big idea. The big idea that I want you to walk out of here when you finish with me is the creation and capturing of value is just one process. Right? If I can go back for a second, it is not two processes. It is one big process, and it's one big process that needs to be anchored on our customers. Okay? So what I will do, what I want to do with you, I want to take you through some basic rules on how to think about monetization, how to think about revenue generation, not from the perspective of the firm, which we still have to care about, but from the perspective of the customers. There's going to be four rules that we're going to be looking at. Uh, these four rules, okay, all of them serve two objectives. They serve just two objectives. One of them is, now that, created, now that we've created satisfaction for our customer, how do we convert the most amount of that satisfaction into value? Okay, that's, rule, that's the objective number one. How do we take these smiles of our customers, this satisfaction, and how do we convert that into the largest possible pie of value, okay? Goal number two, how do we take the fair share of that value back to us, leaving the rest for the customer?
rule number one is one that we don't think about very much, very often, okay? Rule number one is, is as you see over here, you gotta pursue a lean exchange. What the hell do I mean by that? Okay, let me explain to you what I mean by that. We make promises all the day in time to customers, okay? Imagine that I'm a company that sells clickers. Here you've got my most amazing product, the, Reese, the clicker QD San 1000. It is the most amazing clicker you will ever see, says the marketing department. Let's think about this, okay? This is my amazing, the most amazing clicker you will ever hold in your hand. I asked you, this is what I'm selling you, okay? Then I asked you, hey, what are you guys actually paying for? We had performance, uh, uh, we had comfort, we had facilitation, we had ease of use. These answers, with all due respect, okay, are actually wrong. You, ha you are thinking way too much. You gotta think way less than what you're doing right now. I asked you, what is the customer actually paying for? The customer is actually paying for a plastic, some batteries, and I don't know, some electronics that go inside of this. This is what the customer is actually paying for, okay? There is a big difference between what we promise customers what we tell them they will get, they will get comfort, they will get all these things. There's a big difference between what we promise they will get and what they're actually paying for, okay? They're actually paying for something. Now, why would that matter? Well, here you've got what I'm selling you. Over there, you've got what you're looking for when you buy. There is a big gap between what I am paying for and what I actually want, my needs and desires, okay? This gap is what I would call economic waste. The gap between what I promise you will get and what you're literally paying for uh, is economic waste. And this is the first thing we have to look at when we design a revenue strategy. If we're trying to design a revenue strategy that is aligned with what our customers actually want, because that is better for us in the end, the first thing you want to look at is not how much you're charging them, that will come later, the first thing you want to look at is, what are my customers uh, actually paying for? What is the metric by which I'm charging them? Uh, this gap is wasteful. Let me explain what I mean. Well, hold on a second. If I charge you for a clicker, imagine this clicker is $20, because it's the best clicker that you could ever buy. Well, the first problem that you see, okay, is that some of you may not be able to pay for this clicker. It's too expensive. I mean, maybe not in the case of a clicker, but think of the case of a car, for example. Okay? It's too expensive. Or, to get the clicker, you have to go to a store, and the store is inconvenient for you, so you forget, you don't buy it, and what you do, you start clicking from your laptop over here. The next thing that can happen is, okay, imagine you can access the product. You may not consume it. I don't consume clickers all day long. I don't click every single day. So what I've got here, I've got myself, I, I have an asset, I'm owning an asset that I actually don't use properly. And even, and assume that I click all day long and I'm over here, the third type of waste is performance waste. It doesn't literally do what it said it would do. So let's rewind for a second. Here, as a company, I want to make sure that I'm risk-free. So what I typically do is I look inside and say, okay, I'm going to sell you the product. And then that's it. I don't worry about it anymore. But by doing so, customers may not access it. Customers may not consume it. Customers may not actually derive value from it. Right? This, this gap is economic waste. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why would I care? Why would I care about this? I've sold the product. Who cares if the customer is not happy in the end? Well, two reasons to think about. First of all, technology is completely changing this landscape. We've grown from 60 years ago to think about customer needs. And we've, we've worked on market research that tells us everything about customers' needs. Then we move to journeys. 
Now the big thing now is journeys, understanding customer experiences and how people go about their purchase process. Now it's all about consumption, understanding what drives people's consumption patterns and what drives transformers. We have technology available today to tell us exactly when this thing is being used. We have technology available today to tell us exactly how this thing is performing with the customer. Okay, so all of a sudden, you've got options, op opportunities to understand this waste process that is in the middle. Number one. Number two, this waste is actually an opportunity. Right? If over here, I've got a product that is too expensive and people can't afford or people can't reach, then my market is smaller. If I've got a marketplace where people are not consuming the asset properly, then also I'm losing customers and I'm actually reducing the willingness to pay. Over there, if the, customer, if the, if the product is not performing as it is, I'm incurring more risk, more, more cost to offset the, the performance problems. So when I'm talking about exchange, I'm talking about a fundamental question. When you design a revenue strategy, think about literally what your customers are paying for. Traditionally, we're used to selling products, okay? But technology and opportunity is allowing us to do things differently, okay? Allowing us to do things differently. And what you see is that all around us, all around us, businesses are moving away from ownership, selling products and services, to selling time. Later on today, you've got a great speaker about subscriptions and memberships. And I think one of our messages will be, everything can be a subscription these days. And I would tend to agree. But I wouldn't stop there. To use, right, the metric is fundamentally changing and it's moving that way, which is towards our customers, okay? Use to outcomes, what is a measurable result of the thing that I do. So if the gentleman over here said performance, if he said performance, can I actually measure performance on a clicker? And if I can, why am I not charging for that performance? And ultimately to value derived. So what I would like to do is take you through these different models using examples, right? When I look around, I see just about every single industry that I can think of, depending on how advanced technology is, is moving away from selling things to sell access to things, usage of things, outcomes, and actual value. And as I move from the left to the right, all of this waste that we had before, let me just go back, all of this waste. The next question, uh, which is also equally important, which is really about your price. Now that I know what I'm going to be charging for, let, me, uh, let us ask ourselves, how do I know if the price I'm charging is the right one? And here, the rule that you want to follow is, again, towards the customer, you have to understand worth. What I mean by that is, you will see, it's fundamental that you understand what your customer values your offering, whatever that offering is. Now, let me preempt what I'm going to say. When I say this to you, I think everybody will go like this. It's intuitive, right? If I say to you, you want to understand the value of your product to your company, everybody, whenever I say this, says completely understand. But think about the way you guys price. If, I, if you're like the majority of the audiences that I work with, the companies I work with, you don't do exactly what I said. Most companies think about prices, again, from the inside out. What are my costs? What return do I want? What are my competitors doing? That's my price. Okay, even though it's intuitive that we make products for customers and therefore we want to know how much do you value this and then work our price backwards from there, when it actually comes to doing it, we have tend to be much more conservative. Okay, so this is kind of the final message. Let's get to it. Um, understanding the pricing question, financially at least, is incredibly important. 
Let me throw some numbers at you. This has to be, there has to be some numbers in a pricing talk at some point. Take uh, public listed companies, because we can see their income statements. Let's take the Fortune 100 companies, for example. Look at their income statements and do a thought exercise. Imagine you can change by 1%, just 1%, any of these four variables on the right. The fixed costs, or the volume, or uh, the variable costs, or the price. Just by 1%. What the numbers you see there on the right is the change in the profit of the average Fortune 100 company as a function of a 1% change in those variables. This ranking is always going to be the same. It's a mathematical truth. Mathematically, it will always be the same. That is, if you guys have, if your business has one extra second to spend on something that makes the company better off from a bottom line profitability perspective, okay, that attention should go on the prices. The, the, the differences will change depending on the cost structure of the business, but the ranking will always be the same. So understanding optimal prices is by far the most important thing you can do if you're interested in this case about the profitability of the business. Okay? So it's an, it's an incredibly important question, but when I ask companies, so well, okay, then what is your process for understanding whether the number you're charging is the right one? Most processes look something like this. I've got these crystal balls. This is the pricing department. Right? There's a person somewhere with a crystal ball thinking, what should I do, what should I do, what should I do? Ping, that's the number I should be charging, okay? So we need a bit more science, okay? So the question then becomes, how do I understand? For getting the crystal ball, if there's no mysterious answer that comes up to my head, what, what sources of information do I use to understand whether my prices are, are a good one or not? And as I was saying before, Intuitively, it's going to be the customer. It has to be the customer. The customer has the money in their wallet. So it has to be the customer. Because all we, we're talking about potential, right? We want to want what is optimal. So we're always talking about 1% more, 1%, 1% more, more. And the potential, by definition, is established by the customer. The customer will only pay whatever they're willing to pay for. It has to be that. It has to be up here. But of course, because it's hard, or we don't know, or whatever, we start asking ourselves, okay, let me use my costs instead. Right, so a lot of organizations, what they do is they do what's called cost plus pricing, right, where they take their costs and add some sort of margins, okay? Now, cost plus pricing should, it's limited because it has, uh, you're looking at the downside, the bottom side, you're looking at the lower bound, you're looking at how low can I go if I really, really had to, and you try to build your prices up. So if you want to think about costs in a business from a pricing perspective, your costs are just a warning sign. They're like a big lighthouse saying, mer, 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 don't go below this level, otherwise something bad will happen. That's about it. You should never, and I... I seldom say never, but I think I, I, I mean it here. You should never build your prices from the bottom up, right? Because obviously you're going to miss on the upside, which is what you're looking for, where all the, all the treasure is. The other thing we look at is our competitors, of course, right? We all do that, right? We all say, let's forget about this. We all say, what are our competitors doing? If our competitors are selling at 10, then in the company you start asking yourself, Oh, I hate that guy. I really hate that guy. What do we want to be? 10 minus 9, so we kill him? Or 10 plus 1 because we're a premium player? So we do a lot of that, right? It's called competitive indexing. There's actually a name for it. It's called competitive indexing, right? It's basically benchmarking my price based on what the competition is doing. And that's not bad because at least you know that there is some customers out there willing to pay what the competition is charging for. So that's some sort of proxy for value because people are actually buying my competitors' products. But you have to be careful because what if my customer doesn't see me as competitors? So actually I'm, com I'm comparing myself to somebody who's not even my competitor to start with. What if my competitor price like this? So if they price on this, I'm pricing on that. So, you know, mistake on mistake, essentially. 
And here is where I want to draw a difference between willingness to pay and worth. Because before I was saying to you, understand your worth. Willingness to pay and worth are not the same thing. And if you guys, if we do market research to understand what customers are willing to pay, I want you to know that this is not, I want you to remember that this is not what the product is actually worth. Okay? There is the worth of the product to the customer, and then there is the, what they're willing to pay. Think of water, for example. Is the water valuable to us? It's valuable a lot to me right now. Okay? Am I willing to pay a lot for it? No, because there's so much supply of it. There's a lot of competition for it. So you, my willingness to pay can be here, but my worth is up here. So for me to understand worth is important because the gap between the two is what I am lagging, for example, in differentiation. Right? Your efforts to stand out are not calibrated. If I don't understand worth, I hit upon the willingness to pay, and I don't understand how different I actually am. One. Two, if I ask my customer, how much are you willing to pay for my clicker, remember? They go, well, this is a box. I don't know. It just clicks. It doesn't do, very, it doesn't do great things. I'm willing to pay five. Again, push beyond that. What is the worth of your product? You have to understand what is the value of this product to your customer if they understood all of the things they were getting. Because again, if I understand the worth of the, cust of the product to the customer that understands what they're actually buying, the, the gap is a gap in communications. I want to give you an example to make this more clear. So I used to, I did some work years ago for a company that sells showers. I'll make this story very short. It sells showers in the, uh, in the UK, okay? And they spent 8 million euros developing a shower that gives you an amazing shower experience. Amazing. Beautiful water, constant temperature. You could stay there for days. Uh, the shower costs 230 to make, relatively cheap. Most showers in the UK market are between 300 and 500. They went on the marketplace for 1,000 because it's an amazing shower, 1,000. The CEO said, I'm happy to have invested these 8 million euros because I'm going to revolutionize the whole industry. I'm going to disrupt the shower industry because disruption is the word of the day. Okay. Six months later, the shower has sold six units. Not 6,000, not 600, not 60, six units. One to the son of the boss, one to the daughter of the sales per head, and some guy randomly that made a mistake and bought the shower by mistake, and so on. So, we were all sitting in this room, six months later, crisis meeting. What do we do? We've got to pay back the bank for the investment. The salesperson, the chief sales officer, put up his hand. He was very, very upset. Most salespeople tend to be upset. He was very upset, and he said, this cannot be. You cannot be doing this. You cannot think you can sell a shower for 1,000 when everybody's selling between 300 and 500. As you can imagine, his recommendation was, true to a salesperson, bring down the price. Somebody's buying at 500 for my competitor, so just bring it down somewhere close to there, and we'll be just fine. We'll start selling this stuff, and then we'll be just fine. The CEO was just about to admit the fit and press the button on the price change. I was there in the room. I could see it was just there. The, in the other corner of the room sat the chief, inside, the chief customer officer, great lady, sitting over there. She put up her hand and said, before we press on that button, let me tell you something. I've been observing customers, not in their homes, but I've been asking them, how did you make a purchase of the shower? But, so I've been trying to figure out their experience with showers. I've discovered some things that we don't even know ourselves. Many, but I'll give you some of them. If you install our shower, it's so innovative that it takes four hours of the plumber to install. Everybody else takes two days, 16 hours. A plumber in London is 60 pounds per hour, by the way. Our shower is so innovative that when you want to install it, you drill a hole, you drill a hole, you push a cable, you're done. Any other shower, the plumber, if he has any anger issues, 
has a, has a beautiful day, takes out the hammer and starts banging away at the wall. So you have to buy new tiles. You have to get the plumber for longer. Uh, you have to buy more cables. You have to stay in a hotel at night because it's a two-day job. So she said, if we had a customer who actually understood what they were buying and they were rational, they would pay as much as 2,524.99 pound, uh, uh, euros or pounds, whatever it was at the time, okay? 2,525. So try to have this picture, you're trying to have a line in your head, right? Remember, 230 is my cost. 300, 500 is the competitor. 1,000 is my original price. 2,500 is the worth of the product to somebody who actually understands what they're getting. So now she was saying, it's, the issue is not that people are generally willing to pay less than 1,000 because nobody's buying a shower right now is that they don't, they don't understand 1,500, you see? And if she didn't do those numbers, the company would not know this. They would not know the problem is with communication as opposed to my price. And this happens all the time. It happens all the time. We are trying to optimize our prices. What really matters is the worth of the product in the best possible scenario we always have time to go down from there. I'm not gonna charge 2,500. We can have time to go down there. But I need to know what that worth is because once I know that, once I know the potential, then I can start saying, customer, make me go down. Because the worth is there. And so there's different ways of doing this. We don't have time for that today. But it's very important that you stretch it as much as possible as the worth. This shower company, the boss took the finger out of the button and invested in a communications campaign. What did I do? They took 1,000 plumbers in London and said, here, I'm going to install a free shower in your own home. Why? Because plumbers uh, recommend three quarters of all the sales of, of showers in the UK. They're the channel of distribution. So plumbers showered, loved it, and started recommending it. They put the shower in showrooms. They put all these numbers out there. They had commercial. They had lots of things. Soon enough, the shower started selling like crazy at the price of 1,080. The salesperson became very, very happy. No problem there, higher commission. And the cherry on the cake was 12 months later, the price went from 1,080 to 1,600. Guys, they were this close from going down to 500. And now they're charging 1,600. That extra 1,100 is exactly the amount of money they took put it in their pockets, and use it to have more innovation in the future years, as well as pay back the debtors. Okay, so understanding customer worth is absolutely, absolutely fundamental, okay? Now, instead of treating every customer the same, we ask ourselves, well, I've got a room full of customers, there's maybe 400 of you here, and if I look at you, you all value my product very differently, because people are different. So instead of trying to fit a single price to all of you guys, I need to embrace differences. I need to have some sort of understanding of how I'm going to flex my prices in such a way that I can cater to all my market, optimize the opportunity, and without losing you at the same time. And here, there is, oops, too fast. Here, there are three ways of doing it. There are three ways of implementing the price in the marketplace such that I can have different prices and keep my customers happy, in a sense. Three ways. And all these three ways, you'll see them in a second, these three ways, again, start from, the, from an understanding of the customers. They, you, they go from the, uh, the first one has the least amount of customer input, but you will see, depending on how much I know my customer, we will be gradually adding more customer input. So again, we made the customer the focus of this. Three ways. The last one uh, kind of closes everything, okay? And the last, the last rule is craft your message. What do I mean by that? Remember what I've been telling you from the very beginning. The front end of marketing, thing number one, the creation of value. The back end of marketing, thing number two, they go hand in hand. Don't separate them. It's an ongoing cycle. So if they go hand in hand, you've got to be careful. 
if you, on, the, on thing number one, on the front end, you say, my brand is X, if you have commercials, websites, you name it, saying my brand is X, never, never price like Y. Be careful of this conf conflict. You have to craft your prices in a way that is consistent with your brand. I want to show you a few examples. I might run a little bit over time, but I want to show you a, a few examples of what I mean. So the first thing we know is that prices signal information, okay? We all, in psychology, there's tons of uh, articles, books that say this. Prices say stuff to our customers. So if they say things, what I would like to do at the end of the day is to think about, okay, what is my branding message? And how can I also reinforce it with the way I price? As a way of summary, um, the main idea that I want you guys to take away from this room, if possible, if there's just room for one idea, that idea would be, be careful in an organization. Do not decouple the creation of value and the capturing of value parts. Those two things have to be focused on customers because they are the source of everything, the source of business, the needs and then the revenue that comes from it. So what we try to do in, in two hours is to think about how we can take basic decisions about revenue generation, like my business model, my price setting, my, my differentiation, and my messages, and how to rethink about them from a customer perspective. Even though it may sound counterintuitive, the reason why we do this is because we're trying to make the, create the biggest possible pie from the smiles of our customers and then take our slice back for us.